Okay, I think we're ready to get started. So welcome to the first event of the Ivy Energy Policy and Management Center's the first event for 2022. Um, my name is Brian Rivard, and I'm a adjunct research professor at the Ivy Energy Policy and Management Center, and I'll be your host today. Uh, so our topic today is net zero and electrification, an opportunity for Canada. And we have two top-notch spe uh, top top speakers today, uh, Peter Fraser from the International Energy Agency, and Lisa DeMarco from Resilient LLP. And our webinar will be moderated by uh, Brandon Shifley, who is the director of the IB Energy Policy and Management Center. So before we begin, and before I turn it over to Brandon, uh, let me first uh, say thank you to our uh, financial sponsors, the IB Energy Consortium, which consists of Bruce Power, uh, Hydro One, uh, the Power Workers Union, Suncor, and TC Energy and to Mr. Ted Kernahan. We thank you very much for your continued support. I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, this event is being hosted on the campus of the Ivy Business School and Western University. And it's situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, uh, Lunapiwak, and Attawandrom peoples. And it's on lands connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796, and the dish with one spoon covenant wampum. This land continues to be home to diverse indigenous people who, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. So with that, I'd like to turn it now over to Brandon to uh, begin our, our webinar. Thank you, Brian, and thanks to all the attendees. Uh, I think today's gonna be a great session. You know, if we think about electric power and electrification, these are two key elements as Canada pushes towards its net zero ambitions. Yet, given that we are moving towards net zero by 2050, there are a whole host of lingering questions that need to be addressed. And hopefully today's session will shed some light on the paths we need to you know, take to get to net zero, and then highlight some of the potential obstacles that may confront us as we pursue that goal. Uh, the way today is going to work is that Peter and Lisa are going to present for roughly 45 to 50 minutes. Then I'll ask them a couple of questions. Participants, you're welcome to put questions into the Q&A bar at the bottom of your screens. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. We're going to target roughly an hour to an hour and 10 minutes for today's session. Uh, I've also got a couple of questions that were preceded for the speakers. Um, but I think, I think today's session is gonna be really great. And now that we've got some logistics out of the way, I really wanna hand it over to our two speakers. I'm delighted to introduce Peter Fraser as our main speaker for today. Peter has extensive experience in Canada's energy sector. Peter is currently the head of gas, coal, and power markets at the International Energy Agency. Peter rejoined the IEA in 2016, having worked there previously as a senior electricity policy advisor from 98 to 90, or 2004. He also has experience at the Ontario Energy Board and the Ontario Ministry of Energy. Uh, you know, I, I feel a little bit bad, but Peter has degrees from Queens, York, and U of T. He skipped over Western. But despite that clear flaw of decision-making, we're thrilled to have Peter and we really welcome his expertise. Uh, Lisa DeMarco is gonna comment on Peter's presentation and offer some insights of her own. You know, Lisa is the senior partner and CEO of Resilient LLP. She's widely recognized as being a leading expert on Canadian energy and environmental policy, especially with respect to climate change goals and initiatives. She's represented governments and energy companies in a wide variety of gas, electricity, pipeline, and storage matters in front of the OEB and the NEB. She has assisted Indigenous business organizations on domestic and overseas power projects, renewable power projects, alternative fuel power projects, clean tech development and finance, energy storage, carbon capture and storage, corporate social responsibility, environmental disclosure, clean energy finance, sustainable business strategy, and I'm sure I'm missing a handful of other things that she has contributed on. Uh, there are few people better positioned to comment on the IEA's report and on Peter's presentation than Lisa, and I am delighted to have you both. With that, I'm going to be silent for the next 45 to 50 minutes and hand it over to Peter. Peter, Lisa, you just jump in as soon as Peter's done. Thanks to you both for joining us. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Just let me get set up here. 
And uh, thank you. Thanks uh, to Brian, to Brandon, to Laura for organizing this event and giving, giving us at the IEA an opportunity to talk to you about net zero and electrification, and particularly trying to answer the question about whether this is an opportunity for Canada. And let's see if we can get started here. How does that look to everybody? Okay. All right, let me start then. And this for us uh, is getting to net getting to net zero. It's really become the new standard for uh, for climate and energy policy uh, over the last year. That's remarkable how quickly that change has taken place. The IEA has been part of that change. Indeed, I think I think been leading part of that change in the last year and a half. When we, last year, when we published our net zero in 2050, a roadmap to the global energy sector, we provided one rather narrow pathway of how to transform our, our predominantly fossil fuel energy system into one that has net zero emissions as soon as 2050. We followed that up later in the year with another study, uh, another study that's focused on the G7 countries and only looked at their electricity sectors. So I want to use those two studies to talk to you today about what net zero involves and for electricity, for an industrialized economy, and try to show you that there's an opportunity here for Canada to be a leader in that space. And then I'm going to reflect on what I think some changes Canada might need to make, to take advantage of that opportunity. Peter. Yes. Uh... I hate to interrupt you, but for viewers, we seem to have frozen on your intro screen and don't have uh, full screen mode. So okay, uh, let me let me try to see if I can make a change here. Okay. Hmm. Uh, wait a sec. Sorry, for some reason it's not working for me either. Let's try again. Do you see, what do you see now? I'm sorry, sorry to, I'm not seeing the problem. We're still seeing the sidebar and the main slide. Ah, okay. Peter, you could try just exiting and reopening it. That might be a quick fix. Otherwise, I'm happy to display it for you. Just let me know. Okay, okay. Let's try, let's drop it and reopen. Okay, let's start screen share. Now you see the black screen still, or is it just, or is it the full full screen? So we're still seeing the sidebar along. Okay, there we go. Better? Now it's working. Okay, apologies, folks, for the delays, but we've got this up and running now. So let me let me talk about the zero emissions context a little bit from the global perspective before I take you into the G seven and finally, and I'll start with a, a little bit of relatively good news, which is that compared to where we were say six or seven years ago, things are actually looking a little better. You know, up until around uh, 2015 or so, it appeared that we were on a continuous trend of increasing emissions. And, you know, we thought that that might in continue indefinitely uh, out to 2050. A lot of the growth that was happening is happening in developing economies, mind you, but we, you know, we, we've seen continued strong growth and it was a lot of expectation that would continue. A lot of good things have happened since then, uh, starting with the Paris Agreement, starting with the falling costs of wind and solar, uh, uh, and other improvements in, in efficiency. A number of things are going on. So as a consequence and a combination of good technology, uh, good technology and good policies, we no longer think that emissions are gonna grow. Well, we now have our view stated in our state policies 
scenario of the world of our low energy outlook, suggesting that emissions will plateau and then start to slowly decline in the coming decades. But of course, flat emissions don't get you to flat temperatures. And so only the net zero emissions that get you there. And so the pledges that we've started to see in the last couple of years related to net zero, uh, which is really what got us starting to do analysis in this area, um, have, have really also could in principle, if carried out, make a, make a difference. At the same time, and then these are the pledges up through the, up in, in advance of the Glasgow meeting, they still leave emissions quite significantly above net zero. And further, you not only want to get to net zero by 2050, but you want to keep the warming increase by 2100 down to one and a half degrees. We actually have to start cutting emissions now. And that's a much more challenging thing to do. And let me see, there we go. And there's, there's what it looks like. So we have to really start cutting emissions quickly, uh, right away and keep going down. Uh, Keep going down, right down to 2050. So as you can see, we're a very long way from that, despite the improvements that we have seen. So it's going to take a lot of change in our energy system to actually get us down to net zero by 2050 and get us down at a rate that would be consistent with 1.5 degrees uh, growth. So how's that going to be done? Now, it's, it's all very well and good to make pledges of net zero but the question is, what do you need to do about it? And we really have classified what we need to do in, in five areas. And the first thing you have to recognize before you start that is that if we, had, if we kept today's mix, and all that we have growth in demand for energy services. And so that's the gray bars that you see on the top. So if you have today's mix and the growth in energy services, and, uh, and no more efficiency, you'd actually see a growth of 20 gigatons of CO2 uh, by 2050 compared to today. But we, if we use a combination of five things, we can actually bring that down to net zero. So the first thing we need to do is efficiency. And that's the yellow that you see uh, there below. That's efficiency a bit on the energy supply side, but particularly in end use, both in buildings, in industry, and in transport. And those are the various shades of yellow that you see on the chart. The second thing you need to do is to focus on, is to focus on uh, decarbonization of power, of power supply. That's a big source of emissions today, and it's a, big op it's a relatively inexpensive opportunity, thanks particularly to the fall of costs of renewables, is relatively inexpensive to make that transition. So we see a, a very large growth in re renewable electricity generation and also a doubling of nuclear power out to 2050. And that also contributes, contributes quite a bit to the emissions reduction. The third thing you need to do is electrification. Let's take some of that clean electricity that you're producing from low carbon sources, use it, to, to power your cars, electric vehicles, that's a very light blue, and other electrification, mainly in industry, the somewhat, somewhat darker blue that you see on the chart there. Another thing you need to do with that electricity is to make hydrogen with it. And so hydrogen, it gets used in those areas that are hard to, in some of those in industries where it's hard to decarbonize otherwise. Some say in the steel sector, a few other areas, we may need to, we, we expect that we're going to need to use more hydrogen. Hydrogen also may have a role in trucking. And so that's where you see hydrogen there as, a dark, as in the dark blue band. And then the final thing you really need to do is uh, on top of that, it's still not enough. So we need carbon capture, utilization and storage, both in industry and in power. And so that by 2050, you see that, see some, nearly 7 billion tons of CO2 uh, carbon capture and storage needs to be taking place every year. So that combination of, of efforts is what we need to get down to net zero. And I think it's also pretty clear from you from the size of these bars, from the contribution of renewable electricity generation, the contribution of electrification, and the contribution of hydrogen, that electricity is not the whole story, but it's a significant part of the story. So the electricity sector has particular importance 
and getting to net zero. So now, let me now focus more on the electricity sector. And in particular, I want to use this, take advantage of the second study that we've done, which focused on electrification, of, uh, on the, the decarbonization of electricity supply in the G7 country. And let me put the G7 in a bit of context as to what, what G7 is responsible for. We look over a 30 year period from 1990 to 2020, it's been responsible for 878 gigatons uh, there, of, of C, or sorry, it, globally, there's been 878 gigatons of CO2. Globally, there's been three, uh, 301 gigatons of CO2 from the power sector. It's also globally, uh, in 2020, we've had about $400 million, billion dollars rather, of investment in low carbon generation, mainly in renewables. Now, what's the G7's contribution in each of these three areas? So when it comes to emissions, these seven countries are responsible for 38% of the emissions. When it comes to electricity sector emissions, it's even slightly larger, 40%. Now, when I say what's the share of the investment in low emissions electricity sources, it's actually a little smaller, 31%. It actually hides a little bit of the story as you'll learn. The G7 electricity demand hasn't been growing very much and has actually been shrinking over the last decade. So the fact in 2020, it made 31% of the investment in, in low carbon generation, it's actually a very significant contribution to the decarbonization of the power sector in the G7 country. So G7 is very much part of the solution there, but it's, it's starting, it, it certainly, certainly historically has made a very, very big contribution to emissions. So when we start to think about where G7 electricity emissions are going, as I mentioned, mentioned, they've been starting to decline in recent years. That's the dark green line that you see on the screen. And they've been declining for three reasons. First of all, the demand for electricity has actually been falling over the last decade. And that's helped a little bit. Very gradual fall, but the fact that it's not growing makes quite a difference. Second issue, the second point is the growth in renewables, and particularly wind and solar, over the last decade in the G7 economies. That means slightly less demand, bigger share of renewables, means a lot smaller share for fossil fuels. And that brings us to the third factor. There have been a combination of policies, like you have in Ontario with coal phase outs, economics, like you've had in the US with the shale revolution, and carbon pricing, as you've seen in Europe which have together have contributed to a smaller share of coal compared to gas over the last decade. As gas has, has replaced coal, it also reduces CO2 emissions. By contrast, uh, the rest of the world, which is the light green line, emissions have been going up pretty steadily. So it also means a quite different challenge is going forward if you want to get the whole world to net zero. Uh, the power sector. Decarbonizing the power sector in the G7 economies is without stretching it, uh, stretching it, and I don't want to under underestimate the difficulty of this, is a continuation of a trend. Whereas for the rest of the world and developing economies, to get the world to net zero, those emissions need to make a very sharp right turn. It's a very different kind of proposition as we see in the G7. So it's really, if, if we can't do it in the G7, I don't see how you can expect the rest of the world to make this happen. This really does have to lead by example to make, uh, to make net zero by 2050 easy. So let me talk a little bit how demand develops. As I've just shown here, demand has been flat or declining, declining in the last decade or so. It starts to grow quite a bit. And in fact, out to 2050, we see 85% growth in the electricity demand in the G7 countries under a net zero scenario. And the reason for this, of course, is, is increased electrification. Now, what might surprise you to learn is that despite all the electrification that will need to happen in heating between now and 2050, demand for electricity in buildings in our scenario actually falls. Couple of reasons for this. 
number one, buildings themselves have to be much more efficient in our scenario to make this work. But now, number two, of course, the equipment and other things in those buildings also have to be more efficient between now and 2050. And as a result, the total electricity demand in buildings, despite the, the electrification and heating, actually falls. In industry, by contrast, electricity use increases. In certain sectors like steel making, electricity becomes a much more important fuel as it has to replace coal. So that, that and other sectors, we see a lot more use of, a, use of a electricity and industry demand grows. But the biggest growth, of course, is in two other sectors. Number one, transport, electric vehicles, to be short. Uh, all, the, all, the, all the light duty vehicles are electrified by 2050. Buses too. Some heavy transport might be hydrogen. And hydrogen production itself. In our model, not all the uh, hydrogen is produced by electrolysis. About 38% of the hydrogen that's in 2050 is produced by natural gas using carbon capture and storage. But still, even that amount means quite significant amount of, of electricity used to produce hydrogen, driving a big part of that growth. So what does the supply mix look like to make that, to make that? Well, no surprise, the fossil, unabated fossil fuels have to disappear by 2035. And they do more or less. Uh, you can see this little tiny bit of gas there beyond 2035, but it's more or less gone. Uh, coal disappears entirely by 2030. There ever, never was much oil, and of course, it also has to disappear. But if all this disappears, it has to be replaced. And of course, there's all that growth to account for. So what else is coming in? Well, some of what's coming in in the gray there is other fuels to replace the fossil fuels, such as ammonia uh, or hydrogen being used in the power sector. Uh, also, on top of that, there's nuclear, but in the G7 countries, we don't really see it growing. In the countries that are uh, overall, there may be some growth in the countries that are using nuclear power right now, but in other countries, of course, say like Germany, we're not assuming that they're, they're going to launch a nuclear program. They are, the assumption is that they, they stay out. So as a result, nuclear itself, it stays overall rather flat up to 2050. Hydro grows a little bit, that's light blue line and provides an important source of flexibility. But of course, the big story is wind and solar. Wind and solar, you may think they're significant now, but in 2030, they've quadrupled their share. And in 2050, they provide 65% of all the electricity uh, in the G7 country. This is, of course, a remarkable, remarkable shift from where we are today. And that is going to have 66% actually have on the slide. And that's quite a difference, quite, quite a difference and has a number of implications, including for uh, reliability or what we call energy security. Now, the position of the G7 countries when it comes to wind and solar share are all rather different. Uh, you can see Germany, in the United Kingdom uh, with 29% already today. Uh, most more of it wind, but also significant amount of solar. The European Union as a whole is 20%. Whereas at the other end, which are actually the, the two countries with the least use of fossil fuels, France and Canada, the shares of wind and solar are at relatively small. And when you have relatively low shares of renewables, integrating those renewables are rather are are rather straightforward to do, and it's pos uh, certainly possible to do. But we already see in places like Germany and the United Kingdom, a need to start investing specifically to account for the variability of, of, of wind and solar to manage their power system. And what we see in this analysis, when you roll it forward to 2050, and we haven't specified which country is which, but I think you can infer which end of those those bars that Canada would fall at, that even, even the least uh, wind and solar country out of those seven would be using 42% wind and solar by 2040, 47% by 2050, and as high as 75% in some countries. 
enormous share of the energy supply coming from wind and solar power, but also an enormous integration challenge. Uh, so we have what becomes what becomes a fairly uh, modest investment at say 20, at 20, 30 percent becomes very significant uh, rethinking of how the system works. You will have periods where there's much more uh, wind and solar than you will know what to do with. And that could happen in some countries as soon as 2030. And it could happen in quite a few countries in 2040 and 2050. And other periods, because other generations have been pushed out, you will need other sources of flexibility replacement. You will no longer have the coal and the gas plants to balance the system. And so you will need to have something else. And you know, we have a combination of storage, demand response, mo uh, modeled in there. And we've also got increased use of interconnection because in many cases, you can actually improve your situation by being better interconnected with your neighbor who may have complementary resources. That's a point I'll return to a little later. So the bottom line from our G7 electricity study is really that yes, it's doable. Um, but a lot of things, but a lot of things need to happen between now and 2035. So, okay, easy one, no new coal plants. That shouldn't be hard. hard Nobody is actually planning to build coal plants, as we said right now. Start using hydrogen and ammonia in quite significant amounts by 2025. That's a little harder to see. It's not infeasible, but we're already in 2022. And that's, that's going to be a bit of a challenge. But by 2030, that's when it starts to, we start to really ramp up. We have to have four times the wind and solar capacity additions that we had in 2020. All coal plants to, need to be shut. On the demand side, we see new electric car sales reaching 80%. And we've got, we've got to uh, improve the efficiency, uh, improve the efficiency quite substantially of the product. In 2035, we have uh, overall net zero emissions in the electricity sector. But then we can continue beyond that. You can see um, out to 2040, 2050, we've got 40, even by 2035, 40% of the residential space heating demand is met by electricity, mostly heat pumps. And then you can see that continuing to grow out to, out to 2040 and 2050. So we see it uh, you know, extremely challenging for the G7. But as I emphasize the outset, what, G, what G7 countries are being expected to do under this scenario uh, still seems rather less challenging than what would have to happen for the power sectors in many developing economies, where demand and emissions are growing very quickly, and really we're asking them to turn in a totally different, different direction almost immediately. Whereas really we're asking in the G7 really to accelerate trends. So, if, in fact, uh, G7 con uh, economies are committed and other industrialized economies are committed to moving ahead with this quickly, does Canada have uh, a certain advantage in, in maybe make them a leader in this? And I would say Canada does. Um, as probably many of you appreciate, Canada's uh, got a relatively low carbon uh, electricity system today. It's only second only to France in, a, uh, in the share the low, low, uh, least share of fossil fuels in its electricity supply. And when you look at what it's made up of, of course, it's, it's mostly, mostly gas and some coal. And the coal is going down quickly. Uh, but more to the point, Canada's got a lot of hydropower, by far more than any of these other countries. Uh, and much of that hydropower storage hydro. And flexible resources like storage hydro are going to be very valuable resources in a low emission system. And having already such a, you know, might say the natural gifts of nature, nature uh, that have been developed in Canada to allow such a high share of hydropower ought to be an advantage when even Canada will need to increase quite significantly this, the share of wind and solar in their system. Canada ought to be able to do this much more easily than others, than, than other countries in the G7, including its neighbor south of the border. Now, in addition to the, the low shares, of course, Canada's got, got 
quite a diverse power system where those resources aren't evenly spread across the country. And I'd like to think, you see here that how they're spread in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritimes. Uh, that they really, that they really are, they really are spread in a diverse way, and it's a very large country. And when we simulate these things, we often do. You know, one country is one one data point, as opposed to looking in depth at the country. So actually, answering the question of how Canada will do this is something the national you know, the Canadian Energy Regulator, I know, is, is is taking on right now. It's actually going to be a very difficult, uh, very difficult question to answer. But it seems to me that if Canada has this advantage, it has electricity which is relatively cheap. It does have a lot of wind and high, high solar potential. Now, mind you, it may not be as good as some countries, but it's certainly much better than we see in Europe, which is attracting a lot of investment right now. You know, see the quality of the resources we have in Canada, you know, the prices you see in the auctions out in Alberta a few years ago, uh, that, that Wind and solar should be uh, become a big part of the future as demand for electricity goes as a result of electrification. And having this hydropower really ought to make a difference. But really, I think there are probably three challenges I'd like to, you to think about uh, uh, if Canada is really going to take advantage of this opportunity to be a leader in this area. And the first one is uh, concerns the pricing of electricity. Pricing of electricity it depends on the province, but in Canada, uh, there's been a push for a long time that to try to make the, the last unit of electricity more expensive. And that's been done because we want to encourage people to conserve electricity. Perfectly sensible, sensible policy at the time, particularly in those provinces where electricity came from fossil fuels. But now we are entering a different era where there's clearly uh, going to be a policy preference towards encouraging electricity and, and use efficient electrification, if you like, electrification all the same. And if we, we can't get, uh, if we make electricity expensive, it's going to be rather hard to encourage people to shift to, ele shift to electricity. So as, as we continue to add relatively low cost renewables to a to a system where the cost may be relatively high right now, uh, we should try to find a way to make sure those customers who want to, to say, get rid of their gas water heater and replace it with an electric one, have access to actually relatively uh, low cost incremental electricity that uh, allows, them, allows them to buy, to basically heat their water more economically than it is right now. Now I know carbon pricing will, over time, start to encourage the same kind of behavior. But I think you have to really try to rethink uh, this is electricity, which is going to be relatively low marginal cost. Electricity, giving it to customers uh, will encourage this process. But it will take more than pricing for sure. And we really need to think about programs. And here it's not a question of whether it should be not, should be not be electricity efficiency program. They're obviously, will still be a need. Efficiency still plays a very important role in, in our net zero scenario. But electrification uh, also needs to have a role. So on the one hand, load cutting, and on the other hand, load building. And that's because you need to look at it from a, from a carbon point of view and from a total energy system point of view. Something that's not always apparent when you're having discussions about, say, electricity versus natural gas versus other fuel. You have to take a more holistic view and design your programs to allow room for electrification. That really is a bit of, bit of policy advice that I, I think you have to recognize going forward. And there's one final thing, which is the thing that's most obvious from the slide, which is that I think Canada, to take advantage of this, is really going to have to encourage their neighbors to, to neighboring provinces to cooperate with each other when it comes to electricity to the extent of trying to integrate the power systems. BC and Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, maybe Ontario, Quebec, Newfoundland, and Newfoundland and the Maritime Provinces. 
these kind of integrations of complementary ones, of those which are hydro rich with those which are less so, is really probably where, where the best way to take advantage of the opportunity. Yet I know that this is not a simple, simple matter to do politically. And it's not clear at all whether progress can be made. But I think it's necessary. Let me give you an example. This is uh, an extract from the Alberta, Alberta Electricity System Operator Market Report from Tuesday, 14th January 2020. You can probably read that. You probably can't read the detail on there, which the peak demand came at six o'clock. It was 11,698 megawatts, which was actually a record for the Alberta, Alberta internal load at that time. Lower chart shows the wind on that day. And again, you can't really read it, you can't read it quite so clearly on that. But the wind, in fact, uh, capacity factor on that day uh, was not so good. And the reason was today when it had record demand, that day when it had record demand, it was cold. It was between minus 28, minus 30 at six o'clock. Of course, it was dark, six o'clock, and it was calm. So the capacity factor was only, on that day, it was only 5%. And that was despite the fact the previous 30 days, according to this market report, the average capacity factor had been 42.4%. So even though wind blows well in the winter in Alberta, on its coldest day, it wasn't blowing very much. And the future energy system, which on this day relied very heavily on fossil fuels, and to a degree on imports, which supplied 7% of the load, uh, it's going to have to rely a lot more on something when those fossil fuels aren't present. And that something, I think in part, will be getting the share of, getting the share of uh, imports from BC significantly above the 7% level that we saw on that day. It will also require other resources, whether it's Lots of hydrogen has been produced and stored to be burned on that day to make electricity. But it's clear, it's clear that planning the system is going to be much more challenging without the fossil fuels that we, that we have come to, that Alberta's system has come to rely on. I think sharing is one way to make that challenge a little easier. So let me wrap up. Uh, as I said at the outset, net zero has become the standard beyond which now we talk about electricity and climate policy and climate outlooks. A few years ago, when we do, do our World Energy Outlook, we always talked about what our stated policies were going to look like. And we, didn't, we, didn't, we talked about climate scenarios, but as a side. Now everybody wants to hear what our, climate scenario, what our net zero scenario looks like. It really has become the way we talk about the future. Um, Second, I think it's clear that with decarbonizing the electricity supply and electrification are going to play a big role in getting to net zero. And that industrial economies are going to be, are going to have the lead on this. And so so much the challenge is so much greater for the developing economies. The industrialized economies can't prove they can do it. Uh, the developing economies are, are, not, are not going to be inclined to move very quickly. Now, Canada could be a leader in one of those industrialized economies, but I think Canada will need to make some changes as I talked about, whether it's with pricing, whether it's electrification programs, whether it's interprovincial cooperation to make it happen. But if Canada could make it happen, of course, that would be a worthwhile Canadian mission. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, Brendan, if I might, I'll just jump in and uh, stir it up a little bit. If I can really grossly bastardize the brilliant studies that the IEA has done, and first let me thank the IEA for having the vision and the tenacity to actually put forth these studies. They're critical. Globally, I can tell you, numerous countries rely upon them, and they're the first piece. Information is the first piece to really promulgating decarbonization globally. So 
thank the IEA, thank you, and, and certainly thank you for your vision and experience in bringing to bear the outcome of them. But if I'm really crude about the results, what you're saying, if I'm very simplified, I, I've got three main points. And the first is clean electricity is now the critical input to global decarbonization. And it has to be cheap if we're gonna be successful. That's point number one. Point number two is flexibility in the electricity system and the infrastructure that supports it is critical. We can't just do what we've always done. And the third point is in the broad context of decarbonization, we need a new level realm magnitude of broad system planning and interjurisdictional cooperation at a time when polarization and insular behavior is increasing. So is that a fair, really gross characterization of your key points? Well, I'd say that's, that's certainly covered, covered uh, much of the key points and much of the key points that I had. Thank you, yes. So, so there are a few things that come to mind that really seem to be Canadians being their own worst enemy when it comes to electricity planning. And those three key changes that we need. First of all, we do have a carbon market. We have the federal backstop and carbon pricing and it operates almost totally independent and fragmented from the electricity markets. We don't really have any integration of those two markets in a way that's meaningful. Yes, electricity generators are notionally covered, but their dispatch curves and the costing is flown through and it makes no sense how these two markets are not working in a coordinated manner. And in particular, to your interjurisdictional cooperation point, when we're doing north-south uh, trading of electricity, imports and exports from our much, much, much dirtier US electricity counterparts, i.e. an order of magnitude dirtier in many instances, no coordination of the electricity markets right now. What are your thoughts? How do we deal with that? Seems like a bit of a mess to me. Well, I, I cer certainly agree. There's some real benefits from coordination. I, you know, I remain skeptical, despite uh, say the progress Hydro Quebec has made uh, in actually uh, uh, in actually getting much more north south trade going on. You know, as you point out, those the carbon markets won't be won't you know, won't be coordinated in any way. You know, we have Quebec, California, and that's kind of it. Um, but the uh, the opportunity, one of the reasons I wanted to focus the opportunities within Canada is I actually think for a variety of reasons, uh, a variety of reasons, there's a real resistance to, uh, in the US to Canadian power. Um, you know, it's a lot of it's local, you know, there's people have, were in, in between or have a transmission line going through their land or are not pleased about it and use the fact that it's not, the you know, power's not from the United States to, to try and block, block the line. Uh, but it makes it. Uh, but it means that you know we are, we are probably better just to focus on on Canadian electrification. But even within Canada, uh, you know, those are the opportunities staring us in the face. Uh, and we could do it. You know, Alberta, for example, could try to do it on its own and produce a lot more hydrogen as a plan, you know as plans to produce a lot of hydrogen and try to do it that way. But it will be difficult. It would be really difficult to do it. And uh, and there's just such such rich uh, untapped potential, uh, untapped wealth in uh, uh, in in these other provinces that we ought, we ought to be able to tap in. There should be a way to make that a win win. Politically, you can just ask Sean Graham. You know that's it's really difficult for you to deal with your neighbor, or or the late Joey Small would probably tell you the same thing. Uh, history is not is not kind. Uh, to to premiers who have done this in the past, and uh, so it, it's it's a very tough it, 
is it is a a, a very tough political sell in Canada to go down that road. And in some ways, it's easier to, to 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 it seems easier to go south rather than than to go than to go to your neighbor east west. But it's really it would really be a horrendous horrendous shame if that's what happens. We end up contributing in a minor way to the U.S. decarbonization, whereas we could do a lot to really advance uh, net zero in Canada if we, if we use the power here. So we have to change the politics then. We have to get our act together and start being collaborators and cooperators and at a time where east-west splits are increasing with rhetoric, et cetera. Let me talk about um, distributed energy resources and electron waste in particular. It's my understanding that right now we spill about a 6,000 megawatt electricity plant equivalent of water that is clean and cheap, could be clean and cheap electricity um, because of the integration of renewables and or the dispatch uh, flexibility intermittency that we need to address. How, how do we actually, first of all, harness what we've already got? 6,000 megawatts sounds like a lot to me. Well, I think uh, it sounds like it sounds like a lot. I'll take your word on the on the number, but certainly there's there's quite a bit, quite a bit that can be wasted or has to be spilled just because of a combination of factors, including the amount of rain you've had in the previous year. Uh, but yeah, we see in Ontario. I would say Ontario is a leader. Uh, we used in our renewables report last year. We showed that Ontario as sort of the power sector is one of the highest in terms of the share of energy that actually actually has to be curtailed of wind and solar. And when you throw in a bit of nuclear as well, and uh, compared to you know, in, in terms of percentage, compared to to most others, even those with larger shares, with much larger shares of wind and solar, uh, and that's for a variety of reasons, a uh, variety of reasons. But it really begs the question: where I said, well, isn't there something you could do with that electricity? But in Ontario, and for most people, if you want to buy a kilowatt of hour of electricity, it gets a global adjustment charge slapped onto it, and it doesn't. And so it may be zero, but then you have to pay several cents worth of global adjustment for it, and then it's not free anymore. And that's a really bad design. And uh, it's not the only place that does this. You know, Germany does this with its its renewables charge. Uh, but that's the kind of thinking that's got to change. You got to get rid of those kinds of charges per kilowatt hour. And they were put in because electricity was considered to be bad. And it's no longer going to be bad. It's going to be good. And so it's going to be doing good things, getting rid of fossil fuels. And so you have to change the way you charge for it. So Canadian electricity has gone from zero to hero. That's what I'm hearing. Well, not yet, but it's got, it's got a chance. It, it hopefully sh should be. Let's talk a little bit about distributed energy resources writ large. And, um, and let me add on to that. The role of natural gas, are we looking at net zero natural gas electricity or are we looking at net gone natural gas electricity? Huh. Well, that's a good one. Um, we do have a little bit of natural gas with carbon capture and storage in our, in our modeling. Now, again, we haven't done a Canada specific model, so I, I, you'd have to see how that works out. But you can see in places like Alberta, when you're trying to model that, uh, it probably carbon capture and storage with natural gas looks a lot better than than some of the other alternatives. It may be that they can turn out to make very cheap hydrogen there, but we'll see. Um, so you're you're going to need something. You're going to need something fuel based to deal with deal with those situations where you don't where you have a high demand and don't have a lot of wind. And uh, and very you know, so the the kind of situation I, I showed in the slides. And so. There, you think there has to be some kind of role for for natural natural gas. Second thing I say about gas is that you know, I you know I, I deliberately focus the discussion on elect electricity. Uh, when I talk to a gas audience, I say, but it's not all electricity. Actually, there's a big room for gases, plural, in in the future. You know, a lot of us decarbonize gases or not, you know, like hydrogen, like biomethane. There's going to be lots of lots of need for gases. And it's pretty obvious from the electricity side why you need a fuel, some fuels to deal with these, to deal with the situations that we think are going to arise in the future. So fuels aren't going to disappear. Natural gas is still going to get used in other uses as well, not non-energy uses like 
petrochemicals, according to our analysis. And but it's also got is but uh, but if it's going to be used in power, it's going to have to be uh, have to be carbon capture and storage to be consistent with our, our vision. So net zero gas or CCS gas. Net yeah. zero gas or post combustion. Yeah, or yeah, yeah, de yeah uh, decarb gas or either yeah, you know, decarbonize or decarbonized gases, non fossil gas or fossil gas with CCS. Okay, one last element, and then I'll let Brendan go to questions. Um, but uh, let's throw it on the table. Aren't the lessons that we're learning from Eastern Europe right now that fuel diversity is a good thing? It's pretty critical for national security. Um, is that realistic? And are we doing ourselves a disservice by thinking about net zero or net gone gas versus net zero gas in electricity? Well, you know, the situation in, in, in Europe right now is really, really caused by having a single, a single country supplier, single supplier really, who has enough market power to create the situation that it has. And that's what it's been doing since, you know, since last quarter of last year going into this year. Stop offering uh, additional gas that everybody thought they would want to offer into the market, no matter what the price is. They have gas to offer, but they won't sell it. Uh, so when you have a situation like that, it's it's uh, yes yes uh, you have to rethink uh, your security of supply considerations. It's diversifying supplies. And it means you know reducing overall the, the quantities of gas that you need. Uh, in the short and and the situation is made more challenging by a lack of diversity on the power side. It's uh, it's you know it's gas plus renewables system that they want to aim for, and so they got to make sure they have, have be able to have access to the gas that they need to make that work. And they thought they did, but clearly now they have a, a they have a, they have a key supplier who will not supply additional amounts no matter the price. And so that's that's resulting in a that will result in a big rethink of European European energy policy, but not. At the expense of decarbonization, probably if anything, it will accelerate it because it will want to reduce its gas overall gas dependence. Interesting. So over to you, Brennan. If and when we get to some questions, if you can throw in your thoughts on border carbon adjustments, particularly in relation to the electricity sector, I'd love to hear what you have to say, Peter. So uh, you know, we can give that to Peter now. I don't know what the rest of the audience their feeling is, but I'm really enjoying Lisa putting Peter on the hot seat on some of these questions. Uh, I think a lot of this comes from a general sentiment that the math on net zero is really hard. You know, it's really hard across a number of dimensions. You know, we talk about, well, the integration of renewables into, you know, into standard market designs. You know, what that implies is that we're gonna have a lot of really cheap hours of electricity, but when those cheap hours of electricity aren't there, prices are going to spike really high and governments and consumers tend not to like those high spikes. And so then we, we move that into these types of conversations. Well, okay, if we can diversify across geographies, you know, that can offset some of that challenge. And, you know, this is one of your first order sort of recommendations, Peter. And I think anybody who hears that thinks this, this is a good idea. We should have more interjurisdictional cooperation but energy has been a nation building initiative in Canada for decades and has failed time and again. And so there's some you know, reluctance, you know, people are maybe tired of that conversation. And so I'm gonna ask the question slightly differently. I think you're right. I think this is something we need to engage in. What's step one? Well, uh, I actually think step one, the government is, is trying to do a step one right now by doing a net zero study, getting Canadian energy regulator do a net zero study for Canada. Something to, something to stand behind. Hopefully they will go into some of these issues as part of that study. From my point of view is, it, given the, uh, the long history of, uh, long and not particularly successful history you allude to, is to look at this as a, uh, not as a nation building, but actually sort of encouraging provinces to pair off where you actually get most of the benefits anyway. And, you know, if you look at it electrically, even it's quite logical 
uh, you know, BC and Alberta are in the Western Area Connection. So, you know, they're, they're synchronized. So they make sense for them to work together. Ditto, uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba are in the Eastern Area Connection, but right next to each other. Um, and then you have, well, on, on, Quebec is on its own, but you have, you know, you have the Atlantic provinces, uh, Ontario, Quebec. Okay, that's fraught, I admit. But uh, that is, that's an obvious, that's still an obvious, uh, there's, there's still an obvious win there for both everybody and everybody involved if you can find the right, right terms. But it's, it's not try to push it on everybody as a great grand national dream. It's trying to, uh, it's, it's trying to, you know, two provinces working cooperatively, I think it's much more feasible than trying to do something nationwide. If I can jump in, Brendan, I think step one is integrating carbon pricing markets and the electricity markets. We've had such a tough time with policy and egos get involved and provincial identities get involved. Once we go to a market structure, strip out the emotionality of it, saying, okay, you need to sell this and it needs to be net 10% or net 5% and we're going to net zero by 2030. You get your emissions from emissions reductions from Manitoba, you get them from wherever, go. You know, we're gonna see a lot more cooperation. So I kind of want to build on, on that comment, Lisa, and this is going to go back to Peter, but I also like to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, one of the implications of carbon pricing, you know, from sort of a pure economic framework is that you put on a price and you let the cards fall as they may. We're not going to pick technologies. We're not going to pick locations. But I think one of your initiatives or one of your recommendations, Peter, is that electricity needs to be cheaper. And, you know, there's a long run and a short run aspect to cheaper electricity, you know, as we build out renewables, electricity may be cheaper, but if we implement carbon pricing now at, you know, high enough levels, it's going to be a lot more expensive in the short run. And that can maybe undercut this electrification push before it really gains steam. Uh, is there a way to manage that transition? You know, part of this is, you know, at what speed do we hit net zero and when do we hit net zero, not just whether we should hit net zero? Well, yeah, it's, it's a complicated question because Canada's in a slightly different position than a lot of places where the electricity, a lot of the electricity in a lot of the provinces is very expensive compared to what you see in most countries or what you see in Ontario for that matter. Um, but uh, it really strikes me is that, you know, we, we've got this, this legacy of legacy of making electricity, of, you know, putting charges on electricity that uh, really act as a drag to, to this change. And you're quite right about, um, about you know, carbon pricing and just generally rise, raising the market price of electricity. And this is certainly certainly a live debate right now, more of the gas pricing itself, raising the price of electricity is a live debate right now in Europe. Um, but it's uh, at, the same, at the same time, so what I, the notion I have in mind is, is very much, well, let's figure out a way to, okay, I'll build this additional renewables and then I'll be able to sell it to customers who are switching out their gas water heaters for electric water heaters. And so they only buy the electricity that they need. They only operate the water heaters when the wind is blowing or sun is shining. And it turns out to be a lot cheaper to do that than to use gas, especially with gas carbon prices going up the way they're expected to. Because otherwise it doesn't make sense. If you do it at the average price, it will take years before, before the, the carbon price catches up to the level that, that uh, heating, heating your water with gas is expensive. But uh, so you, you need to come up with something like this, which is actually going to accelerate, which is, is kind of a kind of segregation of the new from the old. Um, and historically, that's been, you know, you go back a long way, that's what it was like for electricity for decades, was the new stuff was cheaper than the old stuff. And I think that we're going to see in a number of the provinces, that's going to be the case again. And you have to, you know, so, so you'd like to give people the new stuff at the lower price, and whether it's you have to write down the cost of the old stuff or what you need to do. Uh, what you need to do, I'm, I'm not sure what the best advice would be, but that's, that's what you need to recognize is the cost of the stuff has fallen and uh, for a lot of the time. And then for the times when it's expensive, then you're either not operating or 
or you have to be prepared to pay a lot, as you suggest. You want to jump in, Lisa? Or? Yeah, yeah. I don't, first of all, agree with the proposition that carbon pricing makes electricity more expensive. Carbon pricing makes natural gas fired electricity more expensive. Carbon pricing makes coal fired electricity more expensive. Doesn't make nuclear, doesn't make hydro, doesn't make renewable electricity more expensive. So you're seeing a differentiating there. But in particular, without the storage assets and the flexibility assets that Peter was, I think, rightfully pushing in the system, you're always still pricing based on marginal generation source, which is often a fossil fuel fire source. So you either need to change the pricing algorithm or how the system is bid and offered, uh, bid and accepted, or have a system whereby you have a first in first out and you actually capture and value the emission reductions from taking a generation source out of the mix early. You're, you have a value, an emissions value from that. Um, but again, you have to balance that in the umbrella of security of supply. You don't wanna take out three natural gas fire generators when you don't have enough supply to make your peak demand and on July the 1st. You know, so these are these are issues that we have to look at. But as we see new supply coming in, we can ramp down at, at a beneficial value, the sources that are highest emission emission. And I do really see a role for border carbon adjustments. So we're not putting domestic clean electricity generation at a market disadvantage to very dirty imported electricity. I think you have to do something to make sure that the investments we've made, the coal phase up that's been done, it's been done in a reasonable way. And I, I'm interested to see how the proposed clean energy credit system in Ontario will, will shape up. Peter, do you wanna jump in on that border carbon adjustment question? I know Lisa has brought it up twice. Do you have any thoughts or does the IEA, IEA have any thoughts on that? Um, well, that's actually something we're working on now. I mean, so we don't really have we don't really have an articulated position, but just general generally, uh, certainly something that discussion is advancing quite significant in the European Union, uh, where they basically have a proposal that they would that that will have to be taken up by European Council in a few months, and then if it's accepted, would would go into effect in 2026. Um, but it's uh, it's. It's certainly, certainly the, arg the argument that the existing industry is quite significant. Uh, right now, it's being dwarfed by the discussion on gas. It's, uh, it's, that's, you know, it's a carbon border adjustment, not a high, we pay high gas prices border adjustment. And uh, it, that's, that's going to affect competitiveness in the industry a lot more than that. Yeah, just, to, just to relate the, the marginal Price thing that Lisa was talking about that is that is a live discussion right now, you know, uh, championed by France among others, saying that we have well, most of our electricity doesn't come from fossil fuels. Why do we have to pay a marginal price in the market for our nuclear electricity? Uh, it's based on the gas price. You know, we shouldn't have to pay that. And in fact, France doesn't really pay that. They have a system where a lot of that power gets sold cheaper. But uh, but it's become uh, become a major talking point that that's a really bad thing to do. But you know, you lose a lot of the the you, know, you certainly lose a lot of the opportunity to in, in invest in uh, you know things like storage if you take away the high price hours that that the gas price gas price provides. So there are a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, we're not going to get to them all, unfortunately. But I do have one question for each Lisa and Peter before we go. Uh, I'm going to start with your question, Lisa, and this is maybe real inside baseball for you. And so you feel free to, to sort of give your best guess. But if we look at the steps that have been taken federally, in June 2021, Canada passed the Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act. You know, this is legislation that commits us to certain targets and goals to hit net zero. The math on net zero is really hard. Do you see the federal government and then maybe provincial governments in court in the near future or not? Well, having been in court in the Supreme Court and the lower courts of appeals 
on the constitutional challenge in around Canada's Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, there was a lot of debate really looking very specifically at electricity, which is constitutionally protected for the provinces under Section 92A. And the judgment of the Supreme Court was crafted very, very, very carefully so that if there is a notional overreach of the federal government into electricity generation in particular and, um, and electricity generation facilities, that there would be um, limited scope uh, at best for the federal government to do anything. So I, I think there is room and there's certainly great rhetoric in and around provincial elections from saying we're constitutionally challenging the federal government we're seeing right now in relation to the Emergencies Act that happening. But do we really see the net zero accountability act ending up in court? It doesn't really commit people writ large to net zero. It commits the government to net zero. So in that regard, we'd have to see what the harm was. Um, right now, we're not seeing it being coming a pressure point for provinces, and therefore it wouldn't be the, the juicy media story that you would see give rise to uh, a constitutional challenge. Uh, so that's my current view based on many battle wounds from the prior challenges, um, but that could change. We'll see how things go. So Peter, last question, and this is, this is maybe a bigger picture question and or a softball to end on. I know you've given this talk a number of times across Canada, and you mentioned in our pre-call that you've gotten some pushback on key things. What are the main areas that you've gotten pushback on and what are your main responses to those questions? Well, I'll just let this audience in on, on uh, what I've got pushback on is the context was particularly I gave a presentation out in Alberta, Independent Power Producers Society of Alberta, where I talked about more of the whole of the net of the net zero picture rather than this particular electricity thing. And there was just uh, deep skepticism that you know Alberta or the world wouldn't be using fossil fuels in 2050. Um, that was really fundamental. Um, they really thought, oh, you're just, this is just unrealistic nonsense. This is really kind of, kind of the back I got. And, and I, uh, to that, I say, yeah, it's, it's really tough if you really need, uh, this won't happen just with, with uh, you know, won't, won't happen without carbon prices, but won't just happen with carbon prices either. It's going to take a lot more than that to get there. Uh, and a real political determination that, that uh, the world has to change its energy system. And uh, that's that's so that's the first answer. I, first answer I give. The, the second, there are some you know obviously some specific things that they find really hard to accept a high share of wind and solar as an example. And I think the example I give from Alberta is probably as good a good a reason as any to to say yeah you know, they know how hard it's going to be. But no, we have we you know we do we do see that eventually it will have to come from non fossil fuels. In smaller countries like say Ireland. They've got a lot of wind. They've just decided that they have to build some gas plants. The government announced a few months ago they have to build some gas plants because security supply is really important to them. Now, they'll say that eventually those plants won't use fossil natural gas. They'll use something else, hydrogen or something. Uh, but you know, security supply first and then move there to later. And I think that's probably going to be the more practical course that many, many people are going, are going to follow. May make it may make 1.5 really hard, which means cutting really fast. But in the long term, you know, you have to build a system which is going to be secure all throughout the transition and affordable. And so, if you have to do, uh, you know, invest a little extra up front to ensure that security, or you know, slow down the rate at which you retire some of your fossil plants just to make sure you have that security, that seems like a, a reasonable trade-off that may, you may have to make. Well, Lisa, Peter, I enjoyed this. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Hopefully our audience enjoyed this as well. Uh, thank you very much for being here and taking the time to give us your thoughts. Uh, thank you everyone else for attending. Uh, 
For further information, please you know, reach out to our speakers individually or look at the Ivy Energy Center website where we will post links to these, this talk and other documents that we have. And with that, I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Take care. Thank you.